our next speaker is Raj Chetty, um, and he is going to bring together, I think, a lot of the talk we've heard today about the level of policy. His, his research combines empirical evidence and economic theory to design effective government policies. And the breadth is really awesome. He's worked on tax policies, on unemployment insurance, and um, on education. So for example, he studied the long-term impacts of elementary school education by tracking one million individuals from childhood to adulthood and showing that the quality of teaching in the elementary schools can continue to have powerful impacts even into adulthood two decades later. Professor Chetty received a PhD from Harvard in 2003. He was at Berkeley until 2009 and then returned to Harvard as one of the youngest tenured professors at the, at the university. Uh, but we were lucky to get him here at Stanford in the Department of um, Economics in 2015. And he's a recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award and the John Bates Clark Medal it's given by the American Economic Association to the best American economists under age 40. So please welcome Dr. Professor Chetty. And thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Heidi, for the warm introduction. So I'm going to talk today about how we can improve opportunities for our children in terms of health and economic outcomes in our own communities. But I'm going to start at a very big picture level by talking about the American dream, which, as you all know, is a complicated concept that means different things to different people. But traditionally, one way in which people thought about the American dream is the idea that through hard work, kids could move up in the income distribution relative to their parents. And so in this chart here, drawn from a recent paper published in Science with uh, my colleagues here at Stanford and other collaborators, we assess the extent to which that's actually the case in America, both histor historically and today, by calculating the fraction of kids who go on to earn more than their parents did at a comparable age. So what you can see here is that for kids born in the 1940s and 1950s, it was a virtual guarantee that you were going to achieve the American dream of upward mobility from one generation to the next. You can see, for instance, that for children born in 1940, 92% of them earn more than their parents did uh, in their mid-30s, adjusting for inflation. And you can see that over time, there's been a really dramatic decline in this fraction, a trend that we call the fading American dream, such that for kids who are turning 30 today, who are entering the labor market today, uh, it is essentially a coin flip as to whether you're going to achieve the American dream of doing better than your parents. And so this trend, I think, is not just of interest to economists in terms of understanding what's going on in the economy, but it also reflects more broadly, I think, very important trends in the United States that reflect a lot of the discontent that people across the country are expressing. So for instance, if you look in particular at states in the industrial Midwest and look in particular at men in those areas, you see even steeper declines in rates of men doing better than their fathers. And if you think about the election outcome and the types of places where people express the most frustration, where you see things like the opioid epidemic uh, really taking hold. It's all very consistent with this pattern. So you know, more generally, I would think of this not just as an economic phenomenon, but a broader phenomenon that matters for health outcomes and so forth. Now, motivated by this trend in my research group here at Stanford, uh, the big picture question we're focused on is trying to understand how we can restore the American dream and what we're calling the Equality of Opportunity Project. And our angle on, on tackling that very broad question is to use big data to study how to restore the American dream. So much as you hear about big data being widely applied in the private sector, companies like Amazon and Google using large data sets to improve the products they offer, analogously our vision is that you can use such data to answer questions like this, more generally tackle important social and economic policy issues. So we analyze a range of interventions from childhood to adulthood, as well as a range of life outcomes, focusing primarily on things like income and employment rates, traditional economic measures, but also, as I will show you, health measures, which correlate uh, quite strongly with the economic outcomes we, we tend to focus on. 
Uh, the starting point for much of our analysis, and where I'm going to start in this presentation, is that there are very sharp differences in children's chances of climbing the income ladder across areas within America. So that national trend that I started out with actually masks really substantial heterogeneity across different parts of the country or even different neighborhoods within a city. And so to see that, in this map here, we show the geography of upward mobility within the United States. The way we construct this map is by taking data drawn from de-identified tax and social security and census records for about 10 million children born in the early 1980s, basically all kids born in America between 1980 and 1982. And we ask uh, what their earnings look like in adulthood depending upon where they grow up. So what we're doing here is take the set of kids who grow up in relatively low-income families, families that are at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution, that is parents earning about $25,000 a year. And we classify kids into different metro and rural areas. We divide the U.S. into 740 different metro and rural areas. And in each of those areas, we take the set of kids who are growing up in low-income families and ask, what is the average earnings level of those children when we measure their own earnings when they're about 30 or 35 years old uh, around 2010 or 2015? And so what you can see here is that the map is, is colored so that green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, where kids in low-income families are doing better on average in terms of incomes in adulthood, and red colors that represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. And so first, drawing your eye to the scale on the right side of the map, you can see that in the lowest upward mobility places in the U.S., the darkest red colors, children who grew up in low-income families have average incomes of only $26,000. In contrast, if you grow up in the darkest green-colored places, you have an av average income of $43,000, so quite substantial differences in rates of income, conditional on starting out at the same parental income level. Now, you can see for yourself what the areas of the country are with the highest levels of upward mobility, much of the center of the country, for example, some of the parts of the coast. We have very low levels of upward mobility in the southeast and much of the industrial Midwest. So that's the broad regional variation in rates of upward mobility in America. Now, it turns out that if you zoom in and now look at the data at a finer level, so this, for instance, is showing you the data within the New York metro area. Again, the same statistic, but by county within New York. What you find is that there continues to be substantial variation, even across very narrow geographies. So if we take all the kids who grew up in Manhattan, for example, in a low-income family, so if you're growing up in a low-income family in Manhattan, typically you're living in a place like Harlem, uh, you have average earnings of about $32,000. But if you go a few miles away to Queens, the kids who grew up there have average earnings of about $40,000. So again, quite a substantial difference in outcomes in narrow geographies with the same, uh, starting from the same family income level. So naturally, the question of interest to us as academics and to policymakers is why does upward mobility vary so much ac across areas and what ultimately might you be able to do to increase rates of upward mobility in places that currently have low levels of mobility that are in the red colors in the maps that I was showing you. So I'm going to focus on trying to answer that question and talk about potential policy solutions in various steps, starting with the simple point that most of the variation in upward mobility across areas that I've just shown you is caused by differences in childhood environment. So there are two key points in that uh, first claim. The first is the word caused, that we think these differences across places are not just driven by different types of people living in different places. Of course, the people who live in, say, San Francisco or Salt Lake City, cities with high levels of upward mobility, are different from the people who live in Atlanta. But what we will show you is that if you take a given child and put that child in one of the greener colored areas on that map, that child appears to have much better long-term outcomes. So environment really seems to matter. And second, the reason environment matters is because of differences in childhood environmental conditions as opposed to differences in the types of jobs available in an area or labor market conditions or things like that. So the way in which we demonstrate those results is through an analysis of 7 million families that move across areas in the United States. So again, exploiting these large data sets to do this type of causal inference in this case. Um, rather than going into statistical details of that study here, I'm going to summarize what we find with a simple example. Uh, 
So let's say we take a set of families that start out in Manhattan. And as we saw in the map that I showed you before, if you grow up in a low-income family in Manhattan from birth, you earn about $32,000 on average. When we measure your income at, say, 30, age 30. So now imagine a set of families that move from Manhattan to Queens. As we saw in Queens, we see better outcomes for kids who grow up there from birth. And again, uh, roughly speaking, kids who grow up in a low-income family from birth in Queens earn about $40,000 on average uh, when we measure their incomes at age 30. So now consider a family that moves from Manhattan to Queens with children of different ages, starting with children who move when they're exactly nine years old, which happens to be the earliest age that we can look at in currently available data. So this dot here shows you that when we track these kids who moved when they were age nine, track them forward using tax records for 21 years and measure their own incomes when they were 30, we see that they end up about halfway between the kids who grew up in Manhattan from birth and the kids who grew up in Queens from birth. That is, they're earning about $36,000. They get about 50% of the gain growing up in Queens from birth. So that's for the children who move when they're exactly nine years old. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who move when they're 10, 11, 12, 13, and so on. And what you see is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move from Harlem to Queens, the less of a gain you get. And if you move by the time you're in your early 20s, you get essentially no gain at all. And after that point, the relationship is completely flat. So what do you see from this analysis? I think there are three key takeaways. The first is that where you grow up really matters for your life outcomes. It's not just that the kids who live in Harlem are different from the kids who live in Queens. If you take a given child and move that child from Harlem to Queens, or analogously here in the Bay Area, if we look at kids who move from Oakland to San Francisco, we see really substantial increases uh, in their life outcomes. So environment seems to have a causal effect on children's outcomes. Second, you see that what really seems to matter is childhood environment, not conditions in adulthood. If you move as an adult, it doesn't do a whole lot. And we've seen that now in various studies from our research group and others, where if you help adults move to a different area, once people are in their early 20s, it doesn't really have much of an impact on their economic outcomes. So it really seems to be something about childhood and environmental conditions. The third point, which I think especially for this audience might be particularly relevant, is that you see that every additional year of childhood exposure to a better environment improves your outcomes roughly equally. So if you move to a better place when you're 10 instead of 11, or 13 instead of 14, you get about the same gain. So why is that an important result? As you all know, there's a lot of focus now in a variety of fields on early childhood intervention, so intervention at the very earliest ages, based on the view that those interventions might have much higher rates of return than interventions later in childhood. So our own data suggests that early childhood intervention can be incredibly valuable, but what these results show you is that interventions at later ages, improving the environment in which kids are growing up, even when they're teenagers or adolescents, can continue to be quite valuable. Uh, as you can see, moving to a better neighborhood when you're 13 instead of age 20 can still lead to substantial changes uh, in later outcomes. And so environment matters. In our, based on various studies we've done, it looks like roughly equally, actually, throughout childhood and not just in the very earliest years. There's no reason to give up, for instance, once kids become five or something like that. There's still quite substantial scope uh, to improve children's prospects. Okay, so the next question you might be wondering about is, oh, we've established that some places, some environments, generate better outcomes for kids than others. So what is the recipe for success uh, in the greener colored areas in the maps? Places like Iowa, for instance, or Salt Lake City or San Francisco. What are they doing right that leads to higher rates of upward mobility? So we've examined a, a large range of factors that sociologists and economists have talked about over the years as potential predictors of, uh, of intergenerational mobility. And I'm going to summarize here in the interest of time the five strongest correlations that we find in the data. The first is that places with less residential segregation by race and by income tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Now, there are many different ways to measure segregation from a statistical point of view, and the particular index we use is one developed by Sean Reardon, who's in the education school here at Stanford, 
Turns out, though, these patterns are so stark that you can just see them visually. It doesn't really matter what particular statistical measure you use. So to give you an example of that, this map here depicts racial segregation in Atlanta. The way it's constructed is that each person in Atlanta is represented by a dot using information from the census. And the dots are colored so that whites are blue, blacks are green, Asians are red, and Hispanics are orange. And you can see immediately, no matter what measure you use, it's obvious Atlanta is an incredibly racially segregated city. The whites live in a completely separate part of the city from uh, uh, the blacks. Uh, and so corresponding to that, cities that look like this in terms of residential structure, Atlanta and other such places, tend to have the lowest levels of upward mobility in America, cities that are very spatially separated across racial groups or across income groups. In contrast, if you look at a place like Sacramento, which actually has the same minority share as Atlanta, the same fraction of blacks and Hispanics as Atlanta, you can see here that the colors are much more interspersed, so there's more integration. It's not perfectly integrated by any means, but it's more integrated than Atlanta. And cities that look like this tend to have much higher rates of upward mobility. Now, what exactly is the mechanism for that? It could be because of peer interaction, that if you're around people of different types, maybe people from more affluent families or people who've uh, had a higher level of education, you come into contact with pathways for success, or it could be because of factors like funding for local public schools. When you're in a city like this, the funding base for your school is likely to be better if you're in a low-income family or a minority family because there are higher-income people living nearby than when you're in a city like Atlanta, where you have tremendous separation by race and by income. So we don't know exactly what the mechanism is that drives this relationship between segregation and upward mobility, but that is an incredibly strong and robust pattern in the data. Now, moving a little bit more quickly through the other key correlations we find that give you a sense of what might be driving these differences in mobility, we see that places with a larger middle class, more people between the 25th and 75th percentile of the national income distribution, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility, suggesting there might be a link between inequality and economic opportunity or mobility across generations. Third and, uh, the third and fourth factors I'm going to talk about come more from sociology than from economics. So these are having more stable family structures. So this actually turns out to be the single strongest correlate in the data. Places that have more two-parent families tend to have higher rates of upward mobility than places that have more single-parent households. Now, in understanding the mechanism for that, it's important to note that this is not literally driven by whether your own parents are married or not. And the way that we can see that is if we look at the subset of kids whose own parents are married, if they live in areas with more single parents, they are less likely to climb the income ladder. So again, it's picking up some community-level factor, not literally conditions in your own family. The fourth factor is kind of consistent with that, social capital. So social capital, the way I think about it is the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. Will someone else help you out even if you're not doing well? Often Salt Lake City with the Mormon church is thought of as a canonical example of a place with a lot of social capital and correspondingly uh, has very high rates of upward mobility. Now this idea of social capital, some of you might know, was popularized uh, in a famous book by Bob Putnam at Harvard called Bowling Alone. The reason for the title of that book is that social capital is a very hard thing to measure. And so Putnam used bowling alleys, and in particular, whether people were bowling together as a measure of social capital. Now, much to my amazement, the number of bowling alleys in an area is in fact very strongly correlated with differences in upward mobility that I've been showing you here. Uh, the reason I mention that, though, is that it illustrates an important caution in everything I'm showing you on this slide, which is that these are correlations rather than causal effects. They don't directly tell you what you need to change to get better outcomes for kids. So in particular, I'd be surprised if building more bowling alleys is the you know, solution to increasing upward mobility in America. So you should take this all you know, with that caveat. They kind of give you clues about what we should be doing, what things we should be thinking about, not direct policy solutions. The fifth factor, education, you know, quite intuitively, places that have high, higher quality public schools tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. There's a lot of evidence from other research suggesting that there are important causal effects there. Uh, and so I think that's a particularly interesting uh, area to, to focus on. So 
while I've emphasized here that there are substantial spatial differences in economic mobility and in children's outcomes, I want to note that you know, socioeconomic class and neighborhoods matter, but they're certainly not the only determinants of opportunity. And so I want to give one example of another dimension that cuts within neighborhoods and cuts within socioeconomic class that seems to matter greatly, uh, which is race. So our most recent study from our research group, which we released a couple of weeks ago, looks at racial differences in economic mobility. And what you see here is that there are very stark differences in terms of economic outcomes by race uh, in the United States that are completely unrelated to socioeconomic class and neighborhood. So this chart gives you an example of that. So what we're doing here is plotting the average outcomes of children versus their parents' incomes for whites in the blue circles and black, blacks in the red triangles. And this is done just for boys at the moment, okay? Uh, and so what you can see here is, so each dot here represents the average outcome of children for a given parent household income percentile. So there are 100 dots here for whites and 100 dots here for blacks, showing you the average income percentile that children reach based on their parents' income. Both of those series are upward sloping, indicating that if you're born to a richer family, you do better. So that's you know, well known, there's intergenerational persistence of income. But what's striking about this is that there's just a level shift downward across the distribution for black kids relative to white kids. And what's perhaps particularly striking is that even if you're born to families in the top 1% of the income distribution, who in this sample have an average income of $1.1 million a year, black kids do uh, have lower incomes than white kids almost to the same extent than if you're growing up in a low-income family or a middle-income family. So in other words, being uh, affluent does not insulate you from racial disparities in the United States. In fact, going further in this study, what we find is even if you look at a black and a white boy growing up in a family at the same income level, at the, in this, on the same city block, going to the same school, both with married parents, similar levels of wealth, and so forth, you see almost exactly the same gap. Uh, so that is the black-white gap, prevails even within very similar economic conditions. A lot of people have had the view traditionally that black and white kids have different outcomes because they grow up in very different neighborhoods or attend different schools. But no, that doesn't appear to be the case when you use data covering the entire population. You see this gap is incredibly persistent in America. Now, you can see here that there's a 10 percentile point uh, gap in children's outcomes at the top of the income distribution. That is a very large gap, but it might be hard to just gauge how important it is from just looking at this chart. So I want to switch to a different way to represent these data. If we could pull up the website. Um, let me see if this works. Yes, and so this chart here gives you, I think, a nice vis visual representation that the New York Times put together using our data of the difference in outcomes for black and white kids. So what we're doing here is looking at a set of kids who grew up in rich families in the top uh, quintile of the income distribution and we're tracking the lives of 100,000 kids, black boys in purple, white boys in green, and looking at where they end up in the income distribution. And if you look at the green dots, you can see that white kids tend to stay at the top of the income distribution if they were raised in wealthy families. You can see the green dots appear to be flowing straight or staying in the top group or the second highest group, right? In contrast, if you look at the purple dots, the black boys, they're just steadily falling to the bottom of the income distribution or you know, even below the middle class. So a particularly striking statistic to me is if you're born to a rich family in America as a black boy, you are more likely to end up in the bottom fifth of the income distribution than stay in the top fifth of the income distribution, which is an amazing level of downward mobility, uh, in particular uh, for black boys, very different from the experience of white kids. So now if we can switch back to the slides. Uh, why am I focusing on black boys? Turns out, if you look at girls, the pattern is non-existent. In fact, it's, complete, it's actually slightly reversed. Black girls do better than white girls, conditional on parental income. So this phenomenon is entirely unique to boys uh, and, and not girls, which you know, I think shows you the value of looking at these data in detail. You might have had the intuition that there's there are racial differences in the US and rates of mobility and economic outcomes, but they cut very sharply by gender. And they also, 
differ fairly significantly across areas. So I want to show one other cut on, on this set of issues. So going back to the maps that I was showing you initially and how children's outcomes vary depending upon where they're growing up, let's now do that separately for black men and white men and put them on the same scale. And so what you can see here is that these two maps look like they have an entirely different color scale, right? And that's because the very best places in America for black boys are worse in terms of upward mobility than essentially the very worst places in America for white kids. So that's a striking uh, difference, again, in economic opportunities for, for black and white boys. Now, that's not to say there's no variation. You know, there are some places in America, like Boston, for example, where you do have significantly better outcomes for black boys than other parts. But even if you look you know, like a, at a city like San Francisco or you zoom in on areas that you think of as being relatively good places, there are massive racial disparities in rates of upward mobility for black men uh, within those areas. So all of this gives you a flavor of how economic outcomes vary substantially based on environmental conditions, based on other factors like race, which I don't have the time to get into here, but in this study focusing on racial disparities, we think that a lot of this also has to do with differences in environment, but differences in environment that cut within the traditional notions that we think of, of schools and neighborhoods. That is, black and white kids in a given school have very different experiences, face different types of racial biases, for instance, uh, are growing up in very different families, different peer networks, and so forth. So I want to show one uh, final set of data in, in this part of the talk on kind of just understanding how inequality operates in America, um, turning now to, to health outcomes. So especially given the, uh, this particular audience, I think it's useful to note that these differences in economic opportunity that I've been focusing on are associated with differences in many other key life outcomes, including health. And so in other work we've done in a study published in JAMA a couple of years ago, we examined variation in health outcomes by income and geography using an analogous big data approach. And in this study, we measure life expectancy at age 40 uh, for using population level data, so 1.4 billion records on income and mortality from 2001 to 2014. And so I'll show you a couple charts that, that look similar to what I've shown you before. So here first is life expectancy at age 40 versus household income. And so again, you can see that richer people in America live longer than poorer people. So that's kind of well known from, from prior work but you can see very precisely what that relationship looks like and what the magnitudes are, which are really stark. So if you look at the highest income men shown in blue, for instance, they live about 15 years longer than the lowest income men in America. For women, you also have a substantial gap of about 10 years. It's a smaller gap for women. And interestingly, there's a convergence at the top in terms of the gender gap. So it's well known that women live longer than men but that's particularly true in the low-income population relative to the high-income population. So that's in the nation as a whole. Once again, these patterns are quite heterogeneous across areas. So if you look now at a selected set of cities, New York, San Francisco, Dallas, and Detroit, you see a pattern that's representative of variation in America more broadly, which is that if you're rich, it doesn't matter a whole lot where you live, your life expectancy is pretty similar. We see this for lots of different outcomes, in fact. But if you're poor, it matters a lot. If you live in Detroit, you live about six years shorter on average uh, than if you live in New York City. Similarly, for women, you see, a, you know, see a somewhat similar pattern. I think it's particularly striking if you look in New York and San Francisco for women, that relationship is almost flat, actually, for much of the income distribution. Low-income and middle-income women in San Francisco live almost as long uh, as, as, as high-income women, showing you that it's not an immutable sort of thing that low-income people have to have poorer health and lower income than higher-income people. There are actually places in America already where that's much less the case. And so I gave you a few examples of cities here. Let me show you again on a map what this looks like. So this is showing you uh, the geography of life expectancy in the U.S., just average life expectancy of men at age 40, um, depending upon where they live. And you can see, again, a map that doesn't look identical to the ones that I was showing you before, but is broadly similar. Um, and again, looking at the range, you see that life expectancy varies by something like four years from the lowest to the highest uh, places. And so to give you a sense of magnitudes there, is that a big uh, 
difference or not. So the CDC estimates that if we were to eliminate cancer as a cause of death, mean life expectancy in the US would increase by 3.2 years. So relative to that benchmark, it's as if some of these parts of America, it's like people are immune from cancer in those places, in other places they're not. It would be, you know, it's equivalent to that level of variation. So it's quite a substantial difference uh, in health and presumably other aspects of health beyond mortality uh, across areas, consistent with the differences in economic outcomes that I was talking about earlier. So the point I'm trying to make here is that all of these outcomes, health, uh, economic outcomes, and so forth, which are typically studied in separate fields, I actually think from looking at uh, these various studies together, they're, they're quite strongly related, and the drivers of some of these things are closely related to the drivers of others. So I think it makes sense to think about how to solve these problems in kind of a unified way. And so what I want to do in the remaining time is tell you a little bit about how, in our research group, we're thinking about trying to tackle these problems. And so our approach is we're thinking of, as an analogy to, to medical treatments, a sort of a precision medicine approach to improving opportunity, using big data to provide targeted diagnoses and advice. So let me walk you through how this works at a high level and then give you a couple of examples from our ongoing research. So very much an analogy to medicine, you can think about this in three phases, from diagnosis to treatment to evaluation. It hopefully leads to greater upward mobility going forward. Starting with the diagnosis phase, we think along three dimensions. Where are the places in greatest need? So kind of a geographic perspective like the one that I've been taking. What types of policy approaches might be most effective? And then a temporal perspective. When in a child's life do these disparities arise? Is it when kids are very young? or when they're in school, or at college age, or in the labor market, that can be useful in shaping what types of interventions you want to think about. Then, as I'll give you a couple examples of, we're working with local stakeholders on interventions that uh, could potentially be used to, to treat these diagnoses, and then are evaluating the impacts of those interventions in the hopes of disseminating the lessons that we get from studying a particular place more broadly, eventually, hopefully, having scalable policies to increase upward mobility. So how does that work in practice? Let me give you, uh, let me walk you through a couple examples, starting with this diagnosis aspect of where are the places in greatest need. So one of the projects we're working on at the moment is with the Seattle Housing Authority, trying to help low-income families in Seattle, uh, giving them the, the opportunity to have their kids grow up in better neighborhoods. So in our ongoing work, we are constructing measures of economic opportunity at the census tract level. A census tract is a small neighborhood definition that consists of about 4,000 people. There are 70,000 census tracts in America. So this is zooming in at a much finer geography than where we were before. And you can see when we do that and look at the data for Seattle, there, I'm showing you the same kind of data as before. What are the average earnings of kids who grew up in low-income families in these different places? You can see there's a lot of variation within Seattle. If you grew up in the central di district or a place called Del Ridge, you have average earnings of about $30,000. If you grow up in a place called Normandy Park, you have average earnings of about $43,000. Okay? So uh, what we're do, you know, so in light of that uh, sharp variation across very fine neighborhoods within a city, right, you might think about two different ways to increase upward mobility um, g given what you saw on that map. Okay? So they're, Turning now from where the problems arise, you know, what might we be able to do about it? I think of it as sort of two different types of approaches. Do you want to invest in people or do you want to invest in places in some sense? So thinking about the people-based approach, you might think about just giving people the opportunity or the choice of moving to a better area, right? So that would be one very intuitive thing to do. If you see that some neighborhoods produce much better outcomes or some schools produce much better outcomes for kids than others, why not just help low-income families move to those places? Now, one thing you might worry about in doing that, especially living in a place like Palo Alto that's extremely expensive, you might wonder, well, is that really feasible for low-income families? They're not going to be able to afford to live in a place like Palo Alto, so is that really a practical policy solution? So one of the things that's valuable, I think, about uh, th these kinds of data is that you can assess the extent to which that's the case and potentially help families to move, move to areas where we actually think their kids will do better that would be affordable to them. So let me illustrate how we do that. So this chart here depicts the price of opportunity 
within Seattle. So what we're doing is plotting the measure of upward mobility that I had on the map before on the vertical axis, so the average earnings of kids who grew up in low-income families, versus the average rent in that neighborhood. So each dot here represents a different neighborhood in Seattle, and we're basically plotting upward mobility versus rents. So you can see there's an upward sloping relationship here, as you might expect intuitively. It costs money on average to buy opportunity. Places that have better schools, better conditions in general, tend to be more expensive. However, there's a lot of dispersion around that line, right? There are lots of places that have better opportunity or worse opportunity, even at a given level of rent. And so that creates a very interesting opportunity for policy, which is that you can take families that are currently living in a place like Del Ridge, which actually happens to be a very common place for people receiving housing vouchers from the federal government to live in Seattle. And you can potentially think about trying to help them move straight up on this chart to a place like Normandy Park, which, as I showed you before, seems to have much better outcomes for low-income kids. And we've seen from our prior research that helping families make such moves does, in fact, improve their kids' economic outcomes and health outcomes and so forth quite substantially. And so you can think of those places shaded in that chart as sort of opportunity bargains, places that would be affordable to low-income families, but nevertheless provide quite good outcomes for them. And so using exactly these data, we're in fact doing precisely that in collaboration with the housing and urban, uh, the, the, with HUD and uh, the Seattle Housing Authority, where we're taking the thousands of vouchers that they um, give families every year, and we've started a pilot program that we're calling Creating Moves to Opportunity in Seattle, where we give low-income families that are already receiving this assistance from the government, uh, this assistance from the government, basically helping them use that money more efficiently uh, by giving them information about these opportunity bargains, giving them a little bit of financial assistance to potentially move to such an area, by recruiting landlords to participate in this program, making them more interested and willing to rent to these tenants, uh, by giving them an insurance fund if things go wrong, simplifying the inspection process that they have to go through to lease their apartment to a voucher holder, and providing brokerage services to help make these moves happen. And so that's an example of the type of intervention you can implement with these data, with modern uh, big data sets, that I think can potentially have quite a substantial impact on, on kids' outcomes. Importantly, at essentially no additional cost to, um, to the government. So I was talking with Ben Carson, who uh, runs HUD, and you know, these are the types of programs, regardless of which side of the political aisle you sit on, you want to achieve more bang for the buck with the money you're already spending. We spend about $45 billion a year in the U.S. on affordable housing. So regardless of what you think about affordable housing programs, conditional on spending that $45 billion, you might as well do that more efficiently. Now, we recognize, of course, that helping families move to better neighborhoods is not a scalable solution to improving upward mobility for everyone in the United States. You can't move everyone from one place to another, right? And so ultimately, you have to think about place-based solutions. How do you invest in the places that currently have low levels of upward mobility to increase opportunity for people who live there? And so that's where I think this temporal perspective of thinking about a child's life course from birth to adulthood can be quite valuable. So you could think about interventions like prenatal care, if we're doing some work with the Nurse Family Partnership, for example, to evaluate the impacts of in-home visitation services, you can think about interventions in schools, college access, you can think about trying to improve the stability of families, and so forth. So uh, there's lots of things one can talk about in each of these categories. Given this audience and where we are, in the remaining time, I'm just going to focus on one example, which is college access, helping children as they come through the pipeline have access to the type of higher education that will enable them to ultimately succeed in life, given the large body of evidence suggesting that higher education also plays an important role in this pipeline. And so what I'm going to do here is show you some data that we put out last year that gives you a sense of what access looks like at colleges around America and shows you why access to institutions of higher education, like Stanford, uh, is an incredibly important th thing to think about in the context of this broader problem. So what this chart shows you is the income distribution of undergraduate, of parents of undergraduate students at Stanford. So we're using data here that covers all college students in America. 
uh, over about a 15-year period, so about 30 million students who were able to link to their parents. So everybody who goes to Stanford and all other colleges in America. So I'm showing you here in particular the data for Stanford. And what this is showing you is the distribution of parental income. So you can see at Stanford, for instance, something like 67% of kids come from families in the top fifth of the income distribution, and only 3% of kids come from families in the bottom fifth of the income distribution. Of course, if Stanford was drawing uniformly across the income distribution, each of these bars would be at 20%, right? So as you know, might be intuitive, Stanford has a lot more high-income kids than low-income kids. What I think is particularly striking is if you look at the fraction of kids from the very upper tail at Stanford, so kids who come from the top 1% of the income distribution, that's 15% of the undergraduate student body here. Uh, to give you a sense of the magnitudes, the cutoff for being in the top 1% in the sample is an average annual income of $650,000 a year. So, you know, a large fraction of children at Stanford come from very, very high-income families. Stanford is not unique in that respect. It looks basically the same at Harvard, Princeton, uh, and so on. Now, if you look at other colleges, you see very different distributions. So if you look at Berkeley, which you might have thought would be more equal, it's a, it's a little bit more tilted towards the middle class, but actually not that, that much so. If you look at the State University of New York, Stony Brook, that looks more uh, like even across the income distribution. Then if you look at a place like Glendale Community College, which is a community college in LA that enrolls a lot of students, it's actually the reverse, where those colleges cater more, uh, Glendale in particular caters more to, to low-income students. So what this chart illustrates is a broader phenomenon, which is that there's a lot of income segregation across colleges in America. So similar to the type of segregation plot that I was showing you across neighborhoods before, where all of us recognize that American cities are incredibly segregated. So if you look at Palo Alto versus East Palo Alto, for example, it's obvious that High-income people live in one place and low-income people live in another. A lot of people have the intuition that colleges are more mixed, that college is a place where you're going to meet people from more diverse backgrounds. But actually, if you calculate the same segregation statistics across colleges, you see, as is illustrated in this chart, that colleges in America are just as segregated as neighborhoods. And that's because places like Stanford have essentially only high-income kids and other places have largely low uh, and middle-income kids. Now, why does this matter for upward mobility? So, it's places like Stanford that tend to have a lot of kids who do very well and end up at the top of the income distribution. So, to give you a simple example of that, if you look at, as a simple statistic, the fraction of kids who reach the top income quintile, we see that at Stanford, that number is something like 65%. So, a large fraction of kids end up at the top of the income distribution, not surprisingly, given how selective this institution is and hopefully the value added that uh, professors here uh, provide. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, that's why access really matters, right? Stanford is not moving many kids from the bottom to the top of the income distribution, not because it has poor outcomes, but because there aren't that many low-income kids here to begin with. Now, what this chart shows you is we're plotting the average outcomes of kids from different family income backgrounds. You see that line is almost perfectly flat. So that's extremely important because it shows that the low-income kids who do show up at Stanford do almost as well as the kids from higher-income families, which I think is a very encouraging sign because it goes against the worry that some people have that even if you admitted more low-income or minority kids to places like Stanford, they'd end up struggling and not doing as well. And so in light of that, one of the things we're doing in the policy space here is we've started a partnership between our group and about 200 colleges, including Stanford, where we're linking their internal admissions and applications data to our data uh, in order to answer two questions. How can we increase low-income access to colleges that help children climb the income ladder? So how can Stanford more effectively identify kids from low-income families who might be able to thrive here, who come from certain high schools or, or have certain types of application profiles that might not be, might be getting overlooked or maybe they're not applying to begin with. And so by combining all these different data sets, I think we'll be able to do that more precisely. And second, what types of policies can maximize the success of students from disadvantaged backgrounds? How can you improve outcomes in places like Glendale Community College, for example? So that gives you 
another illustration of how I think these types of data uh, and th these kinds of methods can be used to improve uh, economic outcomes and health outcomes as well uh, in a given place. So let me end by coming back to the chart that I started out with on the fading American dream. I think traditionally people view this, you know, sort of a, naturally you'd view this from a pessimistic perspective that America is not the country that it once was, uh, that drew many people here, including my own parents. Um, but I actually think that this trend poses, presents more of an opportunity and a challenge. So the opportunity to me is presented by the fact that this national trend actually masks the fact that there's a lot of variation within the country. There are places, there are institutions where the American dream continues to thrive. I think the challenge is to figure out what those places, what those institutions are doing well, and to replicate those, success, the, the, those successes across the country. And so I hope some of you will join us in taking up that challenge. Thanks very much. Wow, thank you so much. So um, we will open up the um, question and answers to the audience. We sometimes will see some questions down there. Uh, I, I have a question for you, thinking about the link of economic opportunity and health very n narrowly. I was just trying to think about what kind of data sources are even available to you mm -hmm. for thinking about health. You know, if you were in the UK or one of the Scandinavian countries, you would ha be able to yes. link all of the medical records yeah. to everything else that you're looking at. Yeah. I wonder, are, are there sources in the US that, which would allow you to do that? Yeah, that's a great question. So you'll notice that the health measure I used in this analysis was quite limited, basically mortality, right? Very extreme. Uh, and so the reason for that is exactly that data limitation that you don't have uh, population level information on health. That, that's part, you know, it's some fundamental level related to the fact that the US doesn't have a centralized healthcare system. And so the data, especially for people under age 65, is sort of scattered. Above age 65 with Medicare, you tend to have more systematic data, but there are major challenges in linking that data to the other administrative databases in the US. My hope is that in the coming years, we'll be able to make progress on that front. And in fact, we're in conversations with a number of people at the CDC and other agencies to try to figure out how to link data also at the earliest years, you know, from birth certificates, right. for example, uh, early life conditions, and then also with Medicare later yeah. on. But that would be tremendously valuable for the study. Yeah, maybe, maybe at a state level or something like Medi-Cal yes. um, would allow you That's at least to look at the young, the, the youngest age group, which is 50% of Medi-Cal, 50% yeah. of children are on Medi-Cal. On Medi -Cal. So, yeah. or close to it. Um, here's a question from the audience. Are there missed opportunities or drawbacks to moving urban families to suburbs to try and improve the children's long-term outcomes? Yeah, so you know, there are certainly things you might worry about. So one, uh, you know, it's not obvious that a family living in the center of the city wants to move to the suburbs. Think about things like commute times or availability of jobs it might be much more expensive, not, if not in a literal rent sense, in other dimensions, to live in the suburbs. Um, from more of a social point of view, I think a couple of things that come up are uh, often, I think actually the most important issue is political resistance from people living in the suburbs, not wanting lower income families to move there, kind of the NIMBY, not in my backyard uh, kind of view, like abstractly, I'm happy to have more integrated neighborhoods, just not my own uh, neighborhood. Uh, and so that, I think, is in practice actually, you know, an important political challenge. You can try to address whether that's an important issue empirically by asking whether higher income kids actually do worse if they grow up in areas that are more mixed income. And as best we can tell at the moment, that does not appear to be the case. Integration benefits the poor but does not hurt the rich, which I think uh, is a useful lesson. But I think these are some caveats to keep in mind. <coughs> but more broadly, I mean, the way I think about it is, this is a good short-run solution to be thinking about because we already spend so much money on affordable housing, we might as well do it in a better way. Uh, but in the longer run, you have to figure out how to improve the institutions themselves. Mm. Are there, yes, there's a, yes. Um, I have a question about, in terms of the racial disparities in parent incomes and factors, did you also, or have you looked at 
um, children that are have one or two incarcerated parents, specifically, mm. you know, most commonly, sadly, African American males, um, where this is the yeah. case as a factor in terms of income and upward yeah. mobility. And then, second question is related, sort of piggybacked on that about. Um, because we have such disparities in terms of special education with particularly African-American and Latino males that are in special education, and now we're seeing somewhat of a reverse process where oftentimes kids that may need access to special education services aren't getting them because of their race yeah. and sort of how that impacts outcomes of... Yeah. Yeah, those are excellent questions. So... Incarceration certainly looms large. I mean, to give you one statistic that illustrates the magnitude of the issue, we see in incarceration for everyone in the data. And so you can see for uh, black boys growing up in the lowest income families, on a given day, April 1st, 2010, the date of the 2010 census, 21% of black boys are incarcerated on that day. 21% of black boys growing up in the lowest income families. So it's obviously a huge deal. That said, uh, if you look at the case you described, so let's say you look at the subset of uh, boys who grow up in a family where the dad is not incarcerated, mom's not incarcerated, they're both there, and they're both affluent, let's say, even then you see black boys doing significantly worse than white boys. So the disparities appear to persist even in that case. Now, one interesting pattern that gives you some sense of what might be going on is... Um, Black boys seem to do better if they're growing up in neighborhoods where there are more black men present, more black fathers mm. present in particular. And that could be because fewer of them are incarcerated, could be because they have better job opportunities, you know, what the drivers of that are unclear. But that is a very strong pattern that black boys do better in such places. Black girls' outcomes are unrelated to the rate of father presence in an area, suggesting mm. that it's something in particular about boys maybe having role models or the types of norms that prevail that area and so forth. And in Richmond, there's, they, they have a program for incarceration prevention that is showing really great outcomes. Huh. That, that comment was that there's a, in Richmond was it? There's a, a program for um, preventing incarceration which is showing broader um, social benefits than just the incarceration. Yeah. And so you, I definitely think that can be a piece of it, but again, more at a community level. And then Quickly on your second question on special education, you know, I think that is a potential important you know, aspect of disparities that may be relevant, one that we're not able to quite study with these data, but I think would be useful to study going forward. More broadly, disparities in education, I would think of it not so much as I go to school A and you go to school B, but rather even if we both go to the same school, Within the same school, we end up having disparate educations. That's the type of thing, I think, to focus on. In that, in that um, movie that you showed from the New York Times where the um, high-income boys began to fall, or black boys began mm -hmm. to fall off, how much does incarceration have an it's impact playing a on, role that? on that? Yeah. yeah, so incarceration is definitely a chunk of that, but even as best we can do, if we exclude the people who end up being incarcerated, yes. Um, you'd still get a, you know, something like 80% of that okay. effect would remain. Okay. So the way I look at it is, suppose magically we could have everybody who's currently incarcerated not incarcerated and have the outcomes they otherwise would have. That would help, but it would not come close to closing the gaps that we're seeing in income. So incarceration is one manifestation of the many challenges that black boys in the U.S. face. Okay. Here's another question. Yes. Um, in California, we have half of all the kids being Latino. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, for the most part, they don't get into Berkeley and other schools. They go to community colleges. Mm -hmm. And as you presented the data, that's where a large proportion mm -hmm. are going. Uh, the concern is you know, that community colleges have not always had a great uh, educational mm -hmm. outcome. Mm -hmm. And if indeed we're going to make strides, it would seem to be that they would be a key player, particularly mm -hmm. for our state. Mm -hmm. We've, at Stanford, have tried to work with them as a pipeline into health. But I think this would be a very important process to acknowledge for the state that if, if half of all the kids in California are Latino mm -hmm. and they're not being successful and they go to community colleges because you know, their, their, their school districts were not resourced and the parents don't have any money, that, to me, would be the field to explore of how do we get kids from community colleges yeah. 
to be successful. Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. So a couple different points there that I'd like to unpack. So I agree community colleges are extremely important in terms of numbers, places like Stanford and Harvard and so forth, while they receive a lot of attention, they're trivial in terms of overall counts. It's the community colleges and, and places like that that are really important. And so uh, the reason I actually focused on Glendale Community College, I didn't show this data, but it turns out Glendale actually has quite good outcomes. So we can look at the outcomes of every college in the US and you can see some community colleges have quite high rates of upward mobility for their students and others don't. And so what we're working on in that CLIMB project that I was describing at the end is trying to understand what types of colleges have a lot of value added and what, which ones don't. And then trying to figure out how you might be able to increase value added in the ones that currently don't really help kids rise up as much. So I think there's a great deal of potential there beyond trying to increase access to institutions like uh, the, the elite uh, private colleges. On the issue of Hispanics the, that you brought up, so I didn't spend as much time talking about that uh, data, but that's also in this recent paper on race and economic mobility. We look at the outcomes of Hispanics. Uh, and there's, there's a pretty striking difference between Hispanic Americans and black Americans, which is that at present, Hispanic and black Americans have pretty similar levels of income. But if you look across generations, Hispanics have very high rates of upward mobility relative to blacks, not quite the same as whites, but pretty close. And so our analysis implies that over two or three, something like two generations, about two thirds of the gap between Hispanic and white Americans will be closed. Whereas black Americans look like they're essentially stuck in place mm -hmm. in particular because of black men, because they have such high rates of downward mobility, right? So for blacks, as you saw in that chart, the animated chart I put up, even if you make it to the top of the income distribution, you then again have a high probability of falling back down in the next generation. So if you think about the American dream as climbing a ladder, for black Americans, it's as if you're on a treadmill where you, you know, constantly have to make that, that climb again, whereas for Hispanics, it looks less like that. Are there sex differences in the Hispanic population? Less so than for blacks. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's very stark for black kids in particular. And um, what about this construct of wealth versus income? And yeah. um, could you yeah, yeah. expand on that? So we focus mainly on income for two reasons. So first, from a practical point of view, at the low end of the income distribution, which is where we pay a lot of attention, wealth is pretty limited, whether you're white or black or, or Hispanic. Um, but second, this is actually just a data feature. So on what things do you have good data? It tends to be things that you tax, because the government has to keep good track of that. In the US, we don't have wealth taxes. So you tend not to know about people's wealth in a systematic way, but you know about their income. And so we're able to do more limited things on wealth, like observe the amount of home equity you have and other specific aspects of wealth. And we find that matters, but doesn't really change the picture in terms of what we're showing with income, but worth further exploration, I think, on the wealth dimension. Two questions yeah. over yes, here. Yes, thank you very much, Raj. I have a question about positive deviance. What do we know about the geographic communities who are, I don't know, the one or two or three percent that don't have that gap, um, particularly the black-white gap that you yeah. described? So uh, as you noted, there are essentially 1% of neighborhoods in America, you have small black-white gaps for boys. For girls, it's pretty similar actually in many places. Uh, and so what are the characteristics of those places? Two things which we've touched upon before, well, so really three things. So they tend to have three characteristics. They have relatively low poverty rates. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a general index of they look like good neighborhoods. They have good schools, they have low rates of crime, they have low poverty, there are various ways you can measure it. So that's not all that surprising. Both white and black kids tend to do better in such places. But in general, in those places, you continue to have quite substantial black-white gaps because white kids do much better in those areas and black boys do a little better. So then you've got to layer on two additional things, which ends up closing the gap a bit more. That, that is areas with lower levels of racial bias, so there are various indices of racial bias that you can construct, for example, um, using uh, Google searches, for example, for racial epithets. You can get a sense of how racially biased people are in different areas, and you find that places with lower racial bias tend to have better outcomes for, for black boys in, uh, in particular. And then the second factor, which I touched upon before, 
is high rates of father presence among uh, black kids. And so if you look at places with that combination of three factors, which is a very small fraction of places in America, like two or three percent of neighborhoods, you see relatively small black-white gaps in those places. I think there was one more question. It'll be our last question. So I, I was interested in the, um, the factor you mentioned of stable households. Um, so is, is it just the father being present, or is it... Uh, uh, the uh, ability to take care of a child's uh, growing needs and, and or uh, the availability of two, two incomes in the household. Uh, how does that, uh, un could you unpack that a little? Yeah, so why does father presence matter, basically, is that? Yeah, well, so the first thing to note is that father presence at the individual level, whether your own father is around or not, conditional on household income actually is not all that predictive. So the, I think the way to interpret that is not that father presence literally doesn't matter because on average, if you're growing up in a two-parent household, you tend to be growing up in a higher income household than if you're not. And so whether it's the direct effect of income or the other things associated with income that lead to better outcomes, there's something there. But then as I was saying earlier, Father presence in the broader community seems to be predictive, even conditional on whether your own dad is there or not. And so the mechanism there can't be something about your own family. It's something about either, you know, you see other successful men or your friend's parents are following a particular pathway and that changes what you aspire to do, or that changes norms in an area where you're less likely to get involved in crime and in gangs and that puts you on a different pathway, so forth. I think unpacking, the, you know, basically having a more precise answer to your question be a very valuable direction for, for further work. Well, keeping up with the tradition we established, why don't we stand up and give uh, Raj Chetty a standing ovation?